the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Luke Cobray. Well, here's what we're going to do. I'm going to go ahead and get down on my knees and I'm going to go before the Lord in prayer. If you're able to stand, would you join me in standing as we go before the Lord in prayer tonight? Father God, we come before you in this place, Lord, and we just thank you that we have the opportunity once again to come into the house of the Lord. God, we don't take that for granted that we get to come and freely worship, to freely seek after you, to freely hear your word when people all around the world are dying just to read pages of your word. God, we don't come into this place to hear from a man, to hear from a woman. Lord, we do not come into this house to be entertained, but God, we come into this place to hear from you. We fully acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the senior leader of our church. And we ask that the Holy Spirit tonight would speak to each and every one of us to open our eyes to see and our ears to hear the word that you would cause us to hear today, Father. That would be so so seed sown on a good ground, Father, that it would bear much fruit in our lives. Lord, we lift up all the churches all across the Inland Empire and all around the world that are bringing forth your word tonight and on this weekend, Father. We, give, we ask that you set your presence upon them, Lord, Lord, that your grace be upon them as well. Lord, we don't think of ourselves as better than anybody else, but as co-laborers in the body of, in, in, in the body of Christ, as many members of one body, all serving the purpose of your kingdom, Father. And we give you the praise. Lord, we give you the glory. And Father, we give you the honor. In Jesus' mighty name, we all said, Amen. Amen. Well, if you've got your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Luke. You know, it's amazing how God has things in control. God has such a plan for each and every one of us. And I remember as I was sitting in the control room yesterday, going, uh, going through Pastor Jim's notes. As he got to one of his points, I thought, oh my, he's preaching my message. <laughs> and I started to think, well, I'm going to change it. You know, that way it's not too similar. It's not, that way we're not preaching the same thing and people don't think that here Pastor Luke is up here taking his dad's notes and, and making a message out of it. But you know what, then I was starting to talk to Pastor Jim, Pastor Deborah, and, and I just started to pray to God this morning. And, you know, God said, there's a reason that even before you saw his notes, that you and him were at the same place. And there's something for you and I to take from that tonight. So I truly believe tonight the word of God is so inspired. As I was studying this this message, I won't won't lie to you. I will won't won't I don't try to turn your ears or turn you turn you off or. But I want to tell you that as I was studying this message today, as I was writing it out, man. The presence of God was on my heart for this because this is something in my own life. Oftentimes I tell the young adults, many times in our young adult service, I say that the messages I preach, I preach to myself. Because if there's something that I know I'm going through as a young adult myself, that I know that the young adults in general probably are living them too. But I'll tell you, as I was going through this, I felt, wow, as each point that I was writing out, as each scripture and supporting scripture that I was reading, and there's three, four, five scriptures. And tonight, in order to save time, I don't have those scriptures uh, on the screens, but there are many scriptures that support what we're talking about. As I was going through them to, to develop the message, the Lord, the, the Spirit of the God was just upon my heart and just opened my eyes to, to see that in our day and age, the things that we deal with and the lives that we live and the, the, the gadgets and the, 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 the things that we have at our hands and at our fingertips can hinder so much of our walk with God that we don't even realize it. And I began to be convicted. So I'm not saying tonight tonight that, that a message that I'm going to convict you, but I believe that this is a message that is pertinent to the church today. And I believe that this is a message of us to check our hearts and to, to examine ourselves to see where, where is it that we, that we are at with God? Where is it that our walks are with God? Because I want to bring to you a perspective of, of a certain lady in Luke the 10th chapter. There were two sisters that Jesus visited their house in Luke the 10th chapter in the 38th verse. The title of tonight's message is called Martha, Martha. Because those are the words that Jesus addressed Martha before he gave her an answer to her petition. Now, let me tell you, let's go to Luke the, thir- Luke the 10th chapter in the 38th verse. And we see here, now it happened as they went 
that they entered a certain village. Some say that that village is called Bethany on the outskirts of Jerusalem. And a certain woman named Martha welcomed her, welcomed him, speaking of Jesus, into her house. And she had a sister called Mary who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was distracted with much serving. She approached him and said, Lord, you do not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. And Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things. But one thing is needed, and Mary has chosen that good part, which we will not which will not be taken away from her. So out of these four verses, as I began to study now, as I was praying and seeking God after this answer, and I titled the message, Martha, Martha, why? Because, you know, for me, I like to learn from people. I like to watch people. My wife and I, when we go to Disneyland, she likes to, to go and let the boy play in the little, uh, the water play, the little water play, uh, places and the, the little kitty toys and kitty places in Disneyland. For me, I say that every ride in Disneyland for me is a bench. And every bench I can sit on is like a new ride. There's no line in the, for those rides. And I like to sit. And I like to watch people. I like to see their actions. I like to see how they interact with each other. I like to watch the tourists and, and the groups of people. And one of the things I like to do is learn. And watch people. I've I've done a series and continuing on uh, every once in a while a series called Lessons from the Kings where we take things from the kings of the Old Testament and learn from their lives and learn from their actions. And one of the things I was looking at as I was reading this is what can we take from Martha's experience? Mary is the one that we all credit. Mary is the one that we all like to be, to be like. Mary is the one that we all desire to be, be the, you know, the one who has a priority set in line. The one that Jesus did not correct. But in reality, most of us, if not all of us, are more like Martha. There's a lot we can learn from these four verses, from Martha's attitude, from what Martha learned out of the situation, I believe, but also from what Jesus taught Martha towards the end. And you know, let's take a look at this as Martha begins to serve Jesus Christ. You know, uh, Martha was doing something. Let me say this right off the bat, that Martha was doing the logical thing. When you have somebody come to your house, you want to, we call it today, entertain them. You want to have the supper or a dinner ready. I know that when, when the family calls, when, my, when, when friends call and they say, hey, let's hang out, my wife and I blitz the home. We vacuum. We shove everything underneath all the beds and all the couches and behind everything and every cabinet And we try to present our house clean and as spotless and as nice and dinner ready, hot on the table. Now these days with our modern amenities, you know, we can order pizza or whatever it might be. But Martha was just simply doing what any host or hostess would have done. Jesus Christ, the Bible tells us in the book of John that Jesus loved Martha, Mary, and their brother Lazarus, that he loved them, that he would visit them. In the times of Jesus, and in a, in a, in a public figure that was, that was as great as he, that had thousands of, that would follow, the gift that Jesus would bestow upon people is he would visit them. That was an honor. It was not a burden. It was not like, oh man, Jesus is dropping by the house uninvited. I, got, I didn't even go to the market. I got to try to scrounge together. It was a great honor. It was like having a dignitary or a president Come and stop by your house and say, can we have dinner tonight? Wow. Regardless of how you felt about that person, the honor that they were at your house was alone to say, wow, give me one minute to go vacuum. I'll come open the door in 30 seconds. So Martha was just acting logically. Martha was acting normally. She was doing what you and I would have done to clean the house, to serve the house. But you know, the kingdom of God is not always logical in the eyes of man. And so Jesus Christ, as he comes to Martha and he corrects her, and he says, Martha, Martha, after she comes and brings her troubles to Jesus Christ, he begins to point out to her that her viewpoint, that her opinion is in the error. It's not, it's not about logic. Because let me tell you something. If the kingdom of God operated within the realm of man's logic, there would be a lot more people serving God than there are today. But the bottom line is, is that the kingdom of God involves faith. 
The kingdom of God involves seeking after God first and foremost and not our own logic, not our own ways. And so here Martha was simply just doing what she knew to do. She was simply trying to be a good host. But here in this story, we find two opposites. We find one that was seated at the feet of Jesus in peace. You can imagine Mary seated down on the floor as Jesus was speaking. You know, and, her, and, and then her eyes were, were set upon Jesus and her ears were, were open and everything that he was saying she was just receiving. And then you can imagine Martha in the kitchen in the other room, banging the pots and pans, frazzled, just trying to get something together, keep looking at Mary, hoping that Mary would get the picture. So you see two opposites here out of this story. And while we all desire to be like Mary, the reality is I think most of us are like Martha. We find something to distract us with, whether it be work, whether it be works, whether it be family, whether it be children, whatever it might be, there are so many things in our lives this day and age that distract us, that are meant to take our time. Let me tell you something. The companies that are out there today, the way they make their money is by your time. The more time you spend on whatever it is their product is, the more money they get. Why do you think computers advance as fast as they do? So that you could spend more time doing more things on the computer so you can buy better computers. Why do you think the certain computer software or computer hardware company developed a phone that has a touch screen, that has a user interface that anybody could see? My, my, my 80-some-year-old grandfather has an iPhone. Why do they continue to develop it and make it better and make it faster? Why do they continue to develop software and apps and games and, and different things and productivity so that everything is at the touch of your fingertips? Why? So that you spend more time. Because the more time you spend, the more loyalty you have. And we become distracted. There are so many things in life. Whether it be our phones. Hey, listen, I realized a couple months ago that I was addicted to my phone. I'm here open and honest I was sitting in a staff meeting and my phone was on the table and I realized that I would touch it and I would unlock it just to see it and then it would let it go turn itself back off and then every 30 seconds or so I'd touch it and unlock it. I just had to touch it. And it's funny but it's the truth. We as a 21st century say, Pastor Luke, well that's why I don't have a smartphone. That's why, I, listen, there are things in our lives that draw our attention away. And Jesus Christ coming into Mary and Martha's house was a gift. Now, one of the people saw the gift for, for what it was, and they saw that Jesus Christ wanted to come and spend time and, and teach and, and say the things that he had to say while the other one got so wrapped up in life, got so wrapped up in what life should be like that they missed out on that gift, that they lost, per, they lost the sight, they lost the purpose of what that gift is. So what I want to do tonight is I want to take a couple of looks at what Martha did and what Martha learned from her experience so if you will, let's go back to Luke, the 10th chapter in verse number 40. Luke 10, 40, number one tonight, as far as what did Martha get, says, but Martha was distracted with much serving. Number one tonight, Martha was distracted with much. And in today's day and age, there is much to distract us with. Don't be naive. Let's not be fooled. You may have a smartphone. You may not have a smartphone. I'm not on my soapbox about smartphones. But what I am on my soapbox about is where are we spending our time? Because Martha may have been doing what was right and what was normal at the time. What was to be expected of a host. You may be only doing what is right, what is normal, what is to be expected of a human being in this day and age. But let me tell you something. Where are you paying attention to? You know, the average American watches somewhere between six hour, four and six hours of TV a day. That's amazing. How much time do we devote to God? How much time do we devote to prayer? You know, Pastor Joey was talking in the young adults once, and he said, you know, it's easy for people to memorize the lyrics of a song, their favorite song, whatever it might be. Maybe you're a fan of the Beatles. Maybe you're a fan of, of, of pop. Whatever it might be, you listen to the song three, four times and you can grab a hold of the lyrics of that song. 
Sometimes it's really difficult for you and I to grab a hold of the memory verse or the reference of a verse that we've memorized. Why is it? Where is our attention at? Martha was distracted with what? Martha wasn't doing anything wrong in her eyes. Martha was simply being a host. She was simply doing what was expected of her as the, as the matriarch of a house. So maybe you're just doing what's expected of you as the provider of a house at work or a mother of kids or a father of children, whatever it might be. But the question is, is when the gift of God comes upon us through the, through the love of Jesus Christ, through the word of Christ, what are we drawing our attention to? Because in this day and age, it is so easy for us to be distracted. In this day and age, it is so easy for us to draw our attention to something else. Going back to my soap box of a smartphone, how many times have I studied or have I been in the word of God and I hear my phone buzz because I got an email, I got a news alert, I've got a text message, whatever it might be. And it breaks my concentration and I have to go right to it and say, oh, what was it? Case in point, go to a Starbucks, go to a fast food place and look around. You'll see that people are looking at phones. They're looking at magazines. People today can't maintain conversations with each other. Then how are we going to maintain conversation with God? Who? This is a tough message for me because I'm talk maybe I'm talking about smartphones because that's what God has convicted me of. But Martha was distracted by so much. Matthew Henry said that worldly business is a snare to us when it hinders us from serving God and getting good into our souls. So you say, well, Pastor Luke, I have to work three jobs in order to have my family provided for. I'm not speaking against that. I'm not saying that you have to stop. You can't work. You can't do that. But what I am saying is we need to pay attention to take an example from Martha, to take an example from her sister Mary, to see even though we may have busy lifestyles, what are we doing with our time? Now we're here today, we're in church, that's great, that's wonderful, but if we allow church Sunday night to be our only moments with God, let me tell you something, we're lacking in our relationships with God. It's a tough reality, but it is the truth. So we have got to understand that there is much to distract us with, and we have got to be vigilant in understanding that distractions are all about. You know, I love that the Bible... I shouldn't say that I love the Bible. As a matter of fact, I don't like that the Bible refers to you and I as sheep. I would like to be referred to as a lion or as something cooler than a sheep. I don't know if you've seen sheep. They are dumb. There's this video that was on America's Funniest Home Videos, and it's like always there. And it's all these sheep running through this like little sheep trough, and this one sheep jumps up real high and knocks his head on a beam. And just, you know, they all just keep, I mean, sheep are just clueless. Sheep don't have hard hoofs. Sheep don't have sharp teeth. They don't have retractable claws. They don't have good balance. They're not very smart. Why can't we be, you know, lions? Or, or why can't we be something else? Eagles. The Bible reserves those to, for God. But um, you and I have been reserved to the, to the likeness of sheep. Praise God. There's a reason. 1 Peter, the second chapter, verse 25, I'll put it up on the overhead, it says, For you were like sheep going astray, but have now returned to the shepherd and the overseer of your souls. We were like sheep going astray. You know how a sheep goes astray? Do you know how a sheep wanders off from the shepherd? Pastor Dan had used this, used this illustration, and I just had to ask him this morning, he said, Pastor Dan, can I steal your illustration? And you know, what a sheep does is a sheep grazes like a cow, and the sheep will be grazing, and it will be eating, and the shepherd will be there, and the shepherd will be watching over, and the sheep will see a spot of grass, ooh, that's good, and it'll wander over here and eat that grass, and the sheep will begin to graze, and it'll see another spot, oh, that grass looks good over here, and it'll wander over here, and it'll eat the grass, and then the sheep will continue to graze, and it'll see another spot of grass, oh, that grass looks good, and it'll wander over here, and it will eat that grass, and as it continues to graze, It'll see, oh, there's another piece of grass and it'll wander over here and it'll continue to graze. And it's a slow, gradual process that the sheep is unaware of. But after a while, that sheep has wandered from the herd. It is, un it is now alone, unprotected by the shepherd, left to its own natural defenses, which are none, and is now helpless. 
Church, our lives are much like that. Our distractions in our lives are much like that when we take to the illustration of Martha. Martha was cooking. Martha was serving. It's not like we read that Martha was going nuts. Martha was doing household items. Yet it was important enough for it to be put in the Word of God and preserved over thousands of years so you and I could read and understand that there's an importance of life that has a tendency like sheep that were drawn astray to say, oh, these dishes need to be done. Oh, I need to catch up on my DVR. Oh, you know what? I, I didn't read this latest edition in the newspaper. Oh, well, my kids need to go do this. Oh, I have to go to their sports. Oh, my work is making me do this. Oh, well, now I need to have me time. Oh, I need to, we need to go on a vacation. Oh, we need to do this. And we realize now all of a sudden that we've strayed away and we've wandered away from the shepherd. We haven't even noticed. We haven't even realized, realized when the last time we opened our word was. When the last time we went before God was. When the last time we realized that Jesus Christ was in our house, the temples of our hearts, and all he wanted us to do was sit at his feet and hear his words and accept the gift that he has given to us. But we are so distracted with the things about us in our lives that we lose sight of it like Martha. We are distracted with so much. And I don't want to be a downer. I don't want to be a, you know, a, a, a type of a, a, the, the message that convicts you, that leaves you heavy and say, man, why did I come to church? But what I do want to do is open your eyes. And I pray that the Spirit would speak to us as a church tonight and re let us realize, let us examine ourselves. So the Word of God says that we might look, how are we spending our time? Are we like Martha, doing what we think is right? She was serving Jesus Christ. Maybe it is, like Pastor Jim spoke this morning, maybe it is the volunteerism. Maybe it is your ministry. Maybe it is your goals or your desires that have drawn your attention so much that you have placed them now above the Word of God. And now we wonder, why is our life empty? Why are things not happening the way we were? Why is the Word of God not rich like it once was when we first got saved? Maybe it's because of the distraction of our lives. Heavy, heavy stuff. But things for us to learn, things for us to consider. Number two, in Luke, the 10th chapter, going back a verse and going back into verse number 40, verse number 39 and 40. Luke, the 10th chapter. And she had a sister called Mary, who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. That word also implies that Mary's not alone. You see, Jesus didn't travel alone. We know this because Jesus had his 12 disciples. Wherever Jesus went, people thronged him. He fed the masses. He would heal people and tell them to keep it on the down low so he could get from one place to the next. So now there's an entourage of people. There's a group of people that are with Jesus. Let's just say his disciples find there are 13 people in Mary's house, aside from Mary, her sister. And now we see that, uh, or Martha and Mary. And so now we see Mary who also, so Mary is with everybody else at Jesus' feet. We learn from this in just a moment. So we see that she had a sister, Mary, who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was distracted with much service, much serving. And she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Number two, Martha felt alone. Pastor Jim used this example. I think we've all been there before. I have been the victim and I have been the culprit of this myself. I think you and I can all relate to this as maybe you have been cleaning. Maybe you have do been doing the dishes. Maybe you had relatives or friends over and everybody was sitting on the couch enjoying. Maybe it was on that Super Bowl or that big great game day and everybody was having a great time laughing outside or on the couch and there you are with the dishes alone. Have you ever been there before? I've been on the receiving and the giving end of that one. I know. My wife shakes her head. Yes, you have. We know that that's a lonely feeling. Why do we know that's a lonely feeling? Because when you're out there doing the dishes, when you're out there cleaning up, what do you do? Let's be honest. You make a little bit more noise than you normally would. <laughs> you bang the pot you bang the pan just a little bit more. Oh, I dropped it. I'm sorry. 
Because you want people to sympathize. You want people to grab a hold of what you're doing. To say, oh, wow, well, yeah. If we all just grabbed a hold of this, we could just knock it out real quick. I'm sure that Martha's thought was, if Mary and some other people would just get up and help me real quick, we could knock this dinner out and we could all sit down at the feet of Jesus all together and have a great time. That was Martha's opinion. Hallelujah. <laughs> but Martha felt alone. You know, when you and I are distracted in our walks, when you and I are distracted in our relationships with God, sometimes we feel alone. Sometimes in a relationship with God, I don't know if you've ever been there, but I can say that I have. Sometimes it feels like I'm all by myself and I'm looking over there at the green grass and I see that God is teaching, that God is speaking, and that God is blessing somebody else. And I wonder, what am I missing out on? Why am I not there? But perhaps it is that we are distracted in our serving distracted in our lives and God says Jesus Christ like he said to like he was with Mary and those who were with Mary he spoke to those who listened and perhaps we want God to speak to us in our busyness in our distraction and we say God you understand that I'm a busy person this is the 21st century you understand that I commute 45 minutes to work each way that I work two jobs God you understand that I have kids God you understand that I've got my TV shows God, do you understand that when I wake up in the morning, I got to read the newspaper and I can't get into anything until I have three cups of coffee. God, surely you understand, so speak to me anyways. When God says, give me a moment of your time and I'll speak to you. And you won't be alone. But when we live distracted like Martha, when we get that attitude like Martha, and you know, you know what that attitude I'm talking about. We're talking about the dishes. The, the longer it takes to do the dishes, the more mad you get. The more you grumble. When we have that attitude, we don't realize that all it is is that we're in our own pool of distraction. And all it takes for us to do is put the dishes down, to put the busyness of our lives down, to put the newspapers down, to put the phones down, to turn the TV off and sit at the feet of Jesus Christ. All it takes for us to do to not be alone in this is to go to God and allow God to speak to us like, his, like her sister Mary did. You know, here's a, here's a crazy verse in Psalms, the 50th chapter. I'll go and put it up on the overhead just for time's sake. Psalms, the 50th chapter. I mean, I was reading this and I was just like, whoa. It's the Lord God speaking as a judge. It says, now consider this in the 22nd verse of Psalms 50. Now consider this, you who forget God. lest I tear you in pieces, hello, and there be none to deliver. Whoever's offer, whoever offers praise glorifies me, and to him who orders his conduct all, right, con, conduct all right, I will show the salvation of God. Whoever offers praise glorifies me. You know what you're doing when you're offering praise? You're paying attention to God. So he says, whoever gives me their attention, whoever conducts their lifestyle the way I have taught them because they have given me attention and praise, show them the salvation. But to you who forget God, I forgot. I didn't read my Bible this month. I didn't go to church, you know. I forgot, I just couldn't make time. Says, the Lord says, hey, listen, watch yourselves. Watch yourselves because you find yourself in a tangled web of distraction that you don't even realize that you're in. But all you have to do, thank God, thank God, all we have to do is give God the attention, give God the glory, give God to go sit at the feet, put the dishes down. Sit at the feet of Jesus Christ. Praise God. We're looking at what things that Martha did. Lessons from Martha. Number, number three tonight, Luke, the 10th chapter and the 39th chapter, 40th verse. She had a sister called Mary who also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. Martha was distracted with much serving and she approached him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Therefore, tell her to help me. Number three, tonight, is Martha tried to justify her work. How often in our lives do we justify our time spent? How often do we justify the things that we do? Why? Because when we justify it, we make it right. 
And so Martha was saying, I am right, Mary is wrong, Lord, you need to tell her what's up. And Martha tried to justify it. You know, one of the things that, that, that boggles my mind is when the church of Christ gets so distracted in their relationship with God and the people get so distracted in their lives that they go on that they begin to walk away from God and not even realize it and all of a sudden now they begin to justify their sin. Oh, but God will forgive me where I'm at. Oh, but God's grace will cover me in whatever I do. And they begin to justify their lifestyle that is contrary to God. Why? And the, only, the whole reason that they're there is because unlike Mary, they were like Martha and they were leaving. They were walking away from the feet of Jesus where Mary, who didn't have to justify what she was doing, Mary, who didn't have to explain herself to anybody, Mary, who didn't have to jump up and defend herself, sat at the feet of Jesus Christ while Martha, on the other hand, said, help her, tell her, she's wrong. Now, Martha was an assertive person. No doubt we can tell right off the bat that Martha was peed off. Why? Because she went to Jesus Christ. Do you remember what it said? It said that Jesus was teaching. So Martha was mad enough to go to Jesus while he was teaching and interrupt him. Either that or Jesus had finished teaching and they were sitting at each other staring around. And Martha found an opportune, quiet time when nobody was doing anything and went over to Jesus' ear and whispered, my kind Lord and Savior, please, I would like to bring something to you. My sister Mary is seated here, even though you have long since finished teaching, she has been slothful in her attitude. And I would just like to see, Lord, would you please correct her and let her know that, that the Lord honors those who worketh goodeth. No. Martha went to Jesus and said, Jesus, she's sitting here. I'm working. Tell her to get up. Jesus says, let me pause my sermon to deal with your drama. So not only does Martha justify herself, but do you see what she got herself into? Do you see the, do you see the, the magnitude of what she just did? She just went to God. Jesus Christ, the son of the living God, and just told him what to do. She just gave Jesus Christ an ultimatum. God, Jesus, you justify her or you justify me. You pick which one's right. You know, oftentimes in our lives, we give God those ultimatums and our justification. We say, God, if you truly love me, you'll do this. God, if you really are true, you'll do that. God, justify this or that. But the bottom line is, is, guys, our attitude is not to say, God, make her more like me. Like Mary went to Jesus and said, make my sister more like me. But rather, God, make me more like you. Amen. To understand your ways. So Jesus had a decision. If he was to justify Martha's work, which was, hey, logical. Yes, we know. To say, all right, you know, Mary, just if you could, just I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll hold that thought. You go finish dinner and we'll all come back. We'll sit at the table and we'll have a good conversation. If he would have done that, then he would have justified Martha saying and the story would have read differently. And Martha would have been justified. And Mary's piety Mary's, uh, her, 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 her response to Jesus Christ, her, the, 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 the compassion or the passion that she had for the word of Jesus Christ would have been counted null or, or void. Why? Because now all of a sudden her making a priority to sit at the feet of Jesus would have been void. Why? Because she should have got up and served Martha. But rather Jesus Christ comes back and tells Mary, Martha, nah, -uh. Mary chose the right decision. You have something to learn. So he doesn't discount Mary's right decision. He discounts Martha's. And then so often in our lives, we go before God and we say, God, justify us with this. When rather what we should say is, God, make me like you. Are you with me on that one? Deep, 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 deep. In Ephesians, the second chapter, just for time's sake, I'll put this one up on the overhead because we've got to get moving. Ephesians, the second chapter, verse number eight says, for by grace... You have been saved through faith. Not of yourselves. It's not of works, guys. It's not how hard you work. It's not because you sit in a church. It's not because you volunteer. It's not because you're an usher. It's not because you work in the food distribution center. It's not because you give to the guy with the cardboard box on the side of the street and when you give him the money, you say, God bless. 
Not of ourselves. It is the gift of God, like Jesus sitting in their house. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. Be not mistaken that even though we're talking about Mary sitting at the feet of Jesus, not working while her sister Martha worked, that you and I are called to work, but do not let the works get in the way of the word. Because we were created for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. God has designed us for good works, but God has designed us to sit at the feet of his word, to sit and to get fed by the word of God, to not be so distracted with life, not be so distracted with our actions, not be so distracted with our ministries, with our children, with our husbands, with our wives, with our friends and with our hobbies that we miss out on the word of God. We are called to good works, yes, called to sit at the feet of Jesus Christ. Number four, moving on in Luke, the 10th chapter, verse number 41. Are you with me tonight? Are you still here? I guess you could say this is the title verse. Luke 10, 41, Jesus answered to her and said, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things. How many of you know that when you live a distracted life, when you are focused on things other than the word of God, and when you are not like Mary seated at the feet of Jesus Christ, we have worries and troubles in our lives. Number four is Martha was troubled and worried about much. You know, we've been talking in Hebrews a a few months ago about the peace and the rest of God. Pastor Jim talked about the rest of God not being the type of rest that you sit on a couch and rest. Oh, I feel good that I had a weekend. I feel rejuvenated. The rest of God is beyond physical rest. The rest of God says it doesn't matter what my troubles are. It doesn't matter what my trials are. It doesn't matter what the situation is. It doesn't matter that Jesus Christ stopped by my house and I didn't have dinner for 13 plus ready. It says, you know what? God is in control. And this is Jesus Christ who who fed the multitude with loaves and fish. This is the Jesus Christ who made water into wine. I don't have to cook dinner. Pastor Jim and I were talking about it. He said, yeah, Jesus Christ is the one that could take a soap bar and make it into a salad. Martha didn't need to cook dinner for Jesus Christ. But Martha was troubled and worried about much. And you know, when we live a distracted life, when we live a life that is not focused upon the things of God, when we don't place an importance like Mary did at the feet of Jesus Christ and the importance on the statutes and the things of God, on the word of God, when we come and get fed by the church, when we come and get fed by the word of God, when we come and get the Holy Spirit to minister to us and we make time to to God, you know what? We live a life worried and troubled. Don't you know? Hello. But when you grab a hold of the things of God, when you grab a hold of understanding that God is in control, that there is nothing that is above God, there is nothing that can do anything that God can't handle, then all of a sudden those troubles and those worries don't seem to matter as much. God is good. Philippians, the fourth chapter, verse six or seven, very, very well-known verse says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. You and I can rest assured that when we focus on the Word of God, when we sit like Mary at the feet of Jesus Christ, and we place an importance, when we place a priority on giving God our attention rather than our phones, rather than our televisions, rather than the radio stations, whatever it might be, when we give God the priority in our life, don't you know that the peace of God that surpasses our understanding would guard our hearts through Christ Jesus? Jesus Christ says in Matthew, the sixth chapter, 33rd verse, seek first the kingdom of God and, all the, and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. What was he talking about? He was talking about, you worry about what are you going to eat? What are you going to wear? What, where's your money going to come from? He says, why do you worry about that? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. Why? Because God is in control and you don't have to have troubles and worries when you know that God is in control and your eyes are fixed upon him like Mary. You don't see that Mary was troubled and worried. Last one for tonight. Can I do one more? Last one for tonight. Out of Luke, the 10th chapter, verse number 42. This is it. This is the grand slam right here. Jesus Christ speaking to to Martha, verse number 42 says, but one thing, 
One thing is needed. And Mary has chosen that good part, which will not be taken away from her. Get this. Martha learned that the presence of God wouldn't be taken, only surrendered. Pastor Jim this morning talked about placing an utmost importance on the word of God. Don't you know it's a choice? Don't you know it's your free will whether or not you want to despise the word of God like we talked about this morning? If you don't know what I'm talking about, get online. Get the CD. You need to hear it. We have a choice to make the priority. The word of God, the things of God like Mary. It doesn't matter about dinner. It doesn't matter about sweeping the floors. It doesn't matter about finding the seating for everybody. I want to just sit here and hear from God, she said. Mary was receiving peace and understanding while Martha had chosen the opposite of her sister. She chose to forego the teachings of Jesus and engage in her works because she thought it was the right thing. But Jesus says to Martha, Mary has chosen. We can choose to leave the presence of God, but it cannot be taken from us. Let me tell you why. When you take something, that asserts domination. You've heard this statement before. It was like taking candy from a baby. Why is it easy to take candy from a baby? Because you're bigger than the baby. You're stronger than the baby. You can do that to a baby, and the baby might cry, but you're still bigger. It asserts dominance. But can you tell me what is bigger than God that can take the presence of God away from you? Nothing. The Bible tells us that there is nothing that can separate us from the love of Christ. As a matter of fact, in Romans the 8th chapter, I've got some of that. Romans the 8th chapter, we'll put it up on the overhead as we conclude with these thoughts. Romans the 8th chapter and 35th verse says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine? Nakedness, peril, or sword. Goes on in verse number 38. Paul the Apostle writes, For I am persuaded that neither death, life, angels, principalities, powers, things present, things to come, height, depth, or any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So let me tell you something. There is nothing bigger than God that can come and take from you the presence of God. The Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave his son. The gift of the Holy Spirit, the gift of Jesus Christ has been placed on this, pl on this planet, on this earth, for all men, for us to accept, for us to receive, for us to choose like Mary to sit at the feet of Jesus Christ. But nothing can take it, but we can choose to surrender it. Nobody forced Martha into her works. Nobody forced Martha to leave the room and to prepare a supper, to prepare the service. Nobody forced Martha. She chose to be distracted. Mary chose to sit at the feet of Jesus. So here it is, church. If you remember anything tonight, remember this, that the presence of God is here for you, that God is here, but you can choose to not have it in your life. And wonder why do we live ineffective lives as Christians when we have chosen, like we talked about this morning with Pastor Jim, to despise the word by not taking importance to it, by not counting it as important. You know, all my life my parents told me what you treat as common will become common. And when we treat the Word of God, when we treat service, when we treat church, when we treat the things of God, this, the ministering of the Holy Spirit in our lives as common, and we come into this place callous, not expecting to hear from God, when we go into the, we we'll open the Bible and we say that this is just some, some, some consultant, some advice that I need to get, and when things are good, I don't need to read it, but when things are bad, that's when I open it up. When we don't place priority on it, we choose to not dwell in the spirit, in the presence of God, like Martha, a distracted life. And look what got Martha, worried, troubled, angry, bitter. And we wonder why is it that the church of God, why is it that in our own lives there are times when we have those emotions and those feelings? When in, when in hindsight, when we look back, somewhere along the path, we chose to forego the teachings of God. We chose 
Instead of sitting at the feet of Jesus Christ and hearing the word, being ministered to by the Holy Spirit who Jesus said, when he left, he would give to us the helper. We have chosen through the doctrines of men, through the advice of men to, to find things out on our own rather than how God does. And then we wonder why life is hard. But it doesn't have to be. The beautiful thing about it is, is that it is a choice. That we can choose God. That we can choose, like Mary, to sit down at the feet of Jesus Christ. The story doesn't conclude, give us any more information on Martha in that situation. But I would like to think that after Martha's talk with Jesus, that she realized, wow, he's right. Forget dinner. We'll call out and get some pizza. I'm going to sit at the feet of Jesus Christ. You may live a distracted life. But it doesn't mean tomorrow you have to. It doesn't mean that tonight you have to. It doesn't mean that in your present situation you have to be distracted. All you have to do is, like Mary, make an importance. Set in a divine importance to say, you know what, God's word is more important to me than anything else. And I'm going to listen to it when I hear it. I'm going to pray like I mean it when I pray. I'm going to go before God like he is God, not like Martha to Jesus. And I'm not going to try to tell God what he should do but have God tell me what I should do. And all of a sudden we can choose to stay in the presence of God. Last verse, this verse is, these five words are messages on their own, but just to show you that we can walk away and we can choose to surrender this presence of God. First Thessalonians 5th chapter, verse 19, and an exhortation says, do not quench the spirit. Church, do not quench the spirit by removing the importance of God in your lives yes. by not listening to the word of God by treating God as a consultant of advice an advice giver do not quench the spirit by living how you think things should be done but rather living how God says they should be done today we learn from Martha that Martha was distracted with much there is much in our life that we can be distracted by and we have got to examine our lives to see what is it that we are paying attention to Martha felt alone when we live a distracted life, don't you know that you feel alone? But that is not the calling of your life and that God will be with you when you remember and give praises to Him. Martha tried to justify her works. It doesn't matter what you and I do. We are not justified by the things that we do. We are justified by grace from God. Number four, that Martha was worried and troubled about much and when we live a distracted life, you can be assured that worry and trouble will settle in. And finally, Martha learned that the presence of God can be taken, but it could be surrendered. Jesus wasn't going to take the presence of God from Mary, but Mary could choose to not sit there, but she didn't. You and I, God's not going to take the presence of God away from us. He sent his Holy Spirit, but we can choose to quench it. We can choose to walk away from it. We can choose to ignore it. The decision is ours. And I pray that as we walk out of this place today, while it may not have been a feel good, hallelujah, praise Jesus type of message, I pray that as we walk out of this place tonight, we examine our lives, what we spend our time so that we can be effective Christians, so that we can have hallelujah, praise Jesus testimonies of what God has done in our lives because now all of a sudden we place utmost importance on the things of God like Mary. Did you guys get something out of the word today? Praise God, praise God. God. But hey, listen, there's one more thing I want to do. I want to ask everybody to remain seated. Church isn't out yet. Let me, give, let me get a mo moment more of your time. I want to ask everybody, please don't get up, don't walk around. Let me ask you a question, and you answer it between you and God. Nobody will know the answer except for you and God. The, the question is this. If you were to leave this place tonight, and you were to die, heaven forbid, would you find yourself in heaven, or would you find yourself in hell? It's a simple question. Nobody will know the answer except you and God. But why don't we go over that answer that you might have had in your heart? You know, you might say that, well, Pastor Luke, you know, I don't know if that heaven exists or hell exists. I'm just not sure that it's even real. Can, can, can I tell you something? Just because you don't believe in your head that hell is a real place or that heaven is a real place doesn't mean it's not real. You know, that's like maybe because I grew up in a place where I had never seen a semi-truck that I might truly believe that semi-trucks never existed, yet I could go and stand in the slow lane of the freeway, and lo and behold, I'd meet one face to face. Just because you believe that hell isn't real or heaven isn't real doesn't mean it's not real.
It's a very real place. Real enough for God to mention it in his word, for Jesus Christ to mention it in his teachings, for the word of God to be preserved over thousands of years so that you and I can take it serious. Well, Pastor Luke, you know, maybe you said, I think I'm going to get to heaven. Man, I sure hope I'm going to get to heaven. I really want to go to heaven. Can you show me in the word of God where it says because you think that you're going to get to heaven, that you're going to find yourself there, that because you, that you hope that you're going to get to heaven, that you're going to find yourself there? Can you show me in the word of God where it says that because you genuinely desire to find yourself there, that you're going to get yourself in heaven? Can you show me in the word of God where it says that? Nowhere. Well, you know, but Pastor Luke, I wasn't raised as a Hindu, as a Buddhist, as a Muslim, or any other world religion. So doesn't that mean that by default, by classification, that I'm going to get into heaven? Can you show me in the Word of God where it says it because you weren't raised as a Buddhist, as a Hindu, as a Muslim, any other type of world religion or philosophical thought? Does that mean that you're going to find your way into heaven? Can you show me where it says that in the Word of God? Nowhere will you find that. Well, you know, Pastor Luke, my parents took me to church as a child. I was baptized. I was christened as a child. They told me that I was a Christian as I grew up. We went to church on Christmas and on Easter. Here I am today. I've called myself a Christian all my life. Doesn't that mean that I'm going to get into heaven? Can you show me in the Word of God where it says that because you were baptized or christened as a baby that you're going to find your way into heaven, that somebody blew smoke and water and said a prayer over you that you're going to find your way into heaven? Can you show me in the Word of God where it says that? Nowhere. Can you show me in the Word of God where it says that because your parents took you to church on Christmas and on Easter and because you're here today that you're going to get yourself into heaven? Can you show me in the Word of God where it says it there? Nothing. Can you show me in the Word of God where it says it because your parents told you you were a Christian and because you've given yourself the title of Christian, that means that you're going to go to heaven because Christians go to heaven. Can you show me where it says that, that you give yourself a title that you're going to get into heaven? Nowhere in the Word of God does it say that. That's like me saying that I'm a Honda Civic and I'm going to go sit in the, gar in the garage. At no point in my life am I ever a Honda Civic. Just because you've given yourself a title, because you call yourself a Christian, doesn't mean that you're going to get your way into heaven. Well, but Pastor Luke, you know, I'm a good person. I don't cheat on my taxes. I don't drive too fast on the, on the freeway. I've never robbed the 7-Eleven. I even give to charitable organizations and to humanitarian efforts. Doesn't that mean I'm going to get into heaven? Surely good people go to heaven. Can you show me in the Word of God where it says that good people go to heaven? That because you never cheat on your taxes? Because you've never robbed the 7-Eleven? Because you don't drive too fast on the speed, on the freeway? And because maybe you've even given to humanitarian efforts or, or world hunger relief efforts that you're going to get into heaven. Can you show me in the Word of God where it says that? Church, nowhere. Well, does, will you find that? As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us that our good deeds, according to God's righteousness, are like filthy rags. Nothing you and I can do on our own would ever make us good enough to get to heaven. Here I am. I'm standing here tonight before you. I love you enough. I respect you enough. I honor you enough to not play games with you tonight and to tell you the truth like it is, like it is in the Word of God. You know, you might say, well, Pastor Luke, I know who Jesus is. I know who Moses, who Jonah, who Abraham is. I know some, some of the verses in the Bible. I've memorized some verses. Doesn't that mean that I'm going to get into heaven? Can you show me where it says in the Word of God that because you know who Jesus, who, Mona, who Moses, who Jonah, who Abraham is, that you're going to get your way into heaven? Can you show me where it says that? Nowhere. Because you've memorized some scripture that you're going to get your way into heaven. Can you show me where it says that? Nowhere. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us that the devil in hell and demons in hell know who Jesus is. Yet they're not going to find their way into heaven. The devil himself knows scripture. How do we know that? Because he quoted it to Jesus. Yet he will not find himself in heaven. So truly there's more to than just knowing about God, about Moses, about Jonah, about Abraham, and knowing some scriptures in the word of God. Well, but, but Pastor Luke, in my last church I was an usher. I carried the pastor's Bible. I sang in the choir. I was a youth leader or a children's worker in my last church. So doesn't that mean that I'm gonna get to heaven? Can you show me in the Word of God where it says it because you were a leader in your last church, because you carried the pastor's Bible, because you were an usher, or you worked in the children's ministry or the youth ministry, that you're going to get your way into heaven? Can you show me in the Word of God where it says because you have a card in your wallet that says you're a member to a church, that you're going to find your way into heaven? Nowhere in the Word of God will you find that. There's more to it than that. As a matter of fact, in the book of John in the third chapter, a man by the name of Nicodemus comes to Jesus. And Nicodemus asks Jesus, Jesus, what must I do to get into heaven? Let me tell you a little bit about Nicodemus before I give you Jesus' answer. The Bible tells us in John the third chapter that Nicodemus, Nicodemus was a leader of the Jews, a Pharisee. 
That tells us that Nicodemus had dedicated his young life, probably the first 18 some years of his life, to memorizing and studying the scriptures of God. Nicodemus was welcomed into the temple, the church of his time, to preach and teach the things of God. Nicodemus wore the right clothes. He gave to the poor. He sang the scripture. He memorized the scripture. He did all the right things. And you would think that Jesus Christ would come to Nicodemus, pat him on the back and say, man, Nick, you just keep on trucking because heaven is in your, in your future. But Jesus turns to Nicodemus and he says, Nicodemus, you must be born again. What does born again mean? You've heard that term. Hollywood popular culture has made a mockery out of that. But let me tell you something. From the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible, born again has always meant the same thing. It means that you've given God all of your heart and you've given God all of your life. Everybody look at me, look at me. God is not after your mental ascent towards Him. He's not after your carnal knowledge of who He is. He's after all of your heart. He's after all of your life. Jesus Christ in the book of Revelation speaking to the church. People like you and I says, listen, I know your works. When I come back, I better find you hot or I better find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I will vomit you from my mouth. Whoa. That's a shocking statement designed to get our attention. And what Jesus Christ was saying is that, listen, when it comes time for you to meet him face to face, he better find you hot or he better find you cold. Because if he finds you lukewarm, he will spit you out. He will cast you, reject you out of the kingdom of God. You are deceived if you are lukewarm and thinking that you are going to make it into heaven. Well, what does lukewarm mean? Let me tell you what lukewarm means in your relationship with God. Lukewarm means that according to your relationship with God, you're a little bit up, you're a little bit down, you're a little bit in, you're a little bit out. You have occasional church attendance, an occasional token prayer here and again. Maybe you even got a cross or a St. Christopher around your neck. You're doing your own thing, you're doing some of God's thing. You've been riding that fence. You got too much of God in you to enjoy the world and you got enough of the world in you to where you can't enjoy God. You're right in the middle. And Jesus Christ says, if that's you in this place, you are deceived in thinking that you're gonna get your way into heaven. So then what do we do to get into heaven? You say, Pastor Luke, I appreciate the effort that you're going through. You know what? Let's do this. Let's not do it your way. Let's not find God my way. Let's find God Jesus' way. Jesus Christ said in the book of John that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man goes to the Father except through him. So let's not do it your way. Let's not do it my way. Let's do it Jesus Christ's way. Here's what I'm going to do. In a moment, I'm going to count to three. I'm going to go one, two, and on the count of three, I'm going to go three. And I'm going to hit my hand on the Bible just like that, real loud. And when I smack my hand on the Bible, what I want you to do in a moment, we'll all do it together. I want you to pop your hand up. What you're doing by popping your hand up, you're saying, you know what, Pastor Luke, I want to give Jesus Christ all of my heart, all of my life. You say, well, if I put my hand up, I'm going to be embarrassed. You know what, who cares what somebody around you thinks, the person beside you, the person in front of you, whatever it might be, who cares what they think? Wouldn't it be better if you were embarrassed to spend a moment of embarrassment confessing Jesus Christ in an eternity in hell because you couldn't stand up? You know, Jesus Christ said that if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me before men, I'll deny you before my Father. The decision is yours. He's not going to make you. He's not going to force you. God's not a conniver. He's not a manipulator. He's not going to force his way in. You can't make the person next to you do it. It's between each and every one of us and God. God sent his son, Jesus Christ, down to the earth to die a beaten, bloody mess, to hang naked on a cross so that you and I today could have life and have it more abundantly. But what we have to do is confess him, call upon him to be saved. So who should raise their hand? If you've never given Jesus Christ all of your heart, all of your life, in a moment when I smack my hand on the Bible, you should pop your hand. If you're not sure in this place, say, man, maybe I did that as a child, I don't know. You need to pop your hand. Or if you've been living lukewarm, doing your own thing instead of God's thing, you need to get your hand up and let's get hot for Jesus Christ tonight. You know, don't leave this place tonight without making sure. The Bible says that tomorrow is not promised and that our life is but a vapor. We don't know what tomorrow holds. We just buried a 23-year-old on Friday. You don't know what life will hold for you. Don't take the gamble with your eternal life by walking out of these doors without making sure tonight that you are right with God in this place. So all across this auditorium, all at the same time on the count of three, if you've never given Jesus Christ all of your heart, all of your life, if you're not sure, you need to make sure, and if you've been living lukewarm, you've been doing your own thing instead of God's thing, distracted 
from the things of God all your life, today is the day to get hot for Jesus. On the count of three, here we go. One, two, three. Let me see your hands in this place today. One, two, three, four, five, six. I got you. Seven. I see, some, I see a hand over there. Where are you at? Seven. Eight. Nine. I got you. Nine wise people. You guys, I got you. You can put your hands down. Ten. I got you right there. I got you guys. You can put your hands down. Ten wise people. Where are you at? Number 11. Anybody else in this place? 11 people. 10 wise people. I didn't embarrass them. I won't embarrass you. Where are you at in this place tonight? Say, man, I wonder if I should do this. You should do this. Put your hand up and let, so you can go forward for God tonight. 10 wise people. Anybody else in this house tonight? Say, man, I wish this guy'd shut up. I want to get out of here. Let's move forward for God tonight. That's you in this place. Well, praise God for 10 wise people. Hallelujah. Here's what I want to do. For all 10 of you who raised your hand, and those of you who didn't raise your hand, it is not too late. I didn't want you to be bold. You said you were going to give Jesus Christ all of your heart, all of your life. In a moment, I'm going to ask everybody to stand up. If you raised your hand or you should have raised your hand, it is not too late. I want you to grab your coat, your sweater, your purse, your Bible. A friend, if you need a friend, I need you to get out of your chair and come and meet me here at the altar. You don't get saved by raising your hand. You get saved by asking Jesus Christ to come into your heart, come into your life. So why don't we all stand together? If that's you, be bold. Come on, get up. Get out of your seat. Get out of your chair. Come and meet me right down here at the altar. That's you. You can come. Come on. Come on. Won't you come just as you can come, you can come. Oh, and hear the Spirit call. Won't you come just as you can come. Come on, get out of your seat, get out of your chair. Come on down. It's not too late. Come on down. Come and see. Praise God. Hey guys, listen, today is a new day. Today is the first day of the rest of your life. Here's what I'm going to do. I want to introduce a friend of mine to you. This right over here, this is Pastor Dave. You know Pastor Dave? He hates it when I say this, but he was my junior high pastor. I'm not trying to age him, but he's, you know, I'll tell you what. Pastor Dave is the nicest guy you will ever meet. What we're going to do is we're going to take you right over there. Nothing weird goes on. He's going to lead you in a prayer. You don't get saved by raising your hand. You get saved by asking Jesus Christ to come into your heart, to come into your life. He's going to give you some free stuff. A book that our senior pastor wrote called Welcome to Your Destiny. Super easy reading. It says, hey, I got saved. Now where do I go from here? And he's going to invite you into a program that we have here at the church called Spiritual Personal Trainers. You know, you go to the gym, you see a personal trainer, somebody that helps you build those muscles and get strong, make sure you're eating your spinach like Popeye so you get real nice and buff. We have spiritual personal trainers, a friend, somebody that will meet with you before service, teach you some of the things of God, get you strong in the ways of the Lord so you don't go back, for, go back to the junk that you came from. So if you guys would turn to your right, my left, my, your left, my right, go right over there with Pastor Dave. 